Okay, my ranting is over, so now we're going back to the ties. Left hand side, the Pharisees who were priests, who were in the Sanhedrin, are expecting him to heal the guy with the withered hand. Didn't it dawn on them while they're thinking that if they're expecting him to heal the guy, then he has, then it's God doing it. Right? All they care about is that he's doing it on the Sabbath. Well, shouldn't God heal somebody on any day? That doesn't, that doesn't occur to them either. All that occurs to them is they want to accuse him. So now look at the right hand side. Although he was a son, this is, this is what my pastor made a big stink about this verse. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Yeah, and one of the things that he's suffering is their anger. Again, as I covered it before, looking around at them, their anger, not his anger, looking at them in their anger. And I will prove that in later videos. There are 12 different occurrences with the same meta construction. Just to remind you quickly again. Okay, see, this is with anger in Greek. It's meta plus orges. Okay, but meta applies to the nearest antecedent. That's a grammatical term. The nearest antecedent is autus, which is accusative plural. See? Accusative plural. Masculine accusative plural. So it's not him. It's not his anger. Well, then what is his attitude? His attitude is, first of all, looking around participle, being dramatic, okay? Greek writers shift the participles and nouns when they're being dramatic. That's masculine singular, see? That's what Christ is doing, okay? And this is him having grief, deeply grieved, feeling sorry for them. That's what he's doing. There's no sin there, okay? They're the ones who are angry. And in all the other 12 instances of meta plus a noun with an antecedent, the nearest antecedent, it's translated properly in the other places. But it's not translated properly here. And unfortunately, there are some very famous, current, alive Greek scholars who insist that this is Christ's own anger. So I'm going to have to refute that stupid notion in later videos. Okay? But the reason I'm bringing it up again here is to highlight the meaning of the right-hand phrase. He's a son. He learned obedience from the things he suffered. What is he suffering? Suffered, of course, in ancient English, you know, King James English, means allowed. The root idea of suffering is that you're letting something happen to you and it hurts, but you go through it anyhow. For You know, sometimes you can't help it, sometimes you can't help it. You know, parents suffer their children, they suffer for their children, and they suffer their children. You know, they allow their children to cause them pain because it's their kids. They are grieved, like Christ is grieved on the left-hand side. Okay, see? Here's the word for grieve. Sulepeomai. Lupeomai. It's one of Pauline's, Paul's favorite words, lupeomai. Lupeo in particular. All right? He's suffering. He's grieving. He's looking at them in their anger. He knows they want to test him and accuse him for healing on the Sabbath. For healing. A God act. They're going to accuse him for doing a God act on God's day, which is the Sabbath. You see how sick those Pharisees are? So now let's take a look on the right-hand side to 5.8. Okay? Because it's kind of important. My pastor made a big stink about this. This sounds in the English, oh, so pious, right? Okay, but that's not what the Greek really is. My pastor had a field day with this verse. I'll never forget it. He said it's a paranomasia. Ematen, okay, that's learning. That's translated learned here. Ematen from Montano. It's like learning in school. Ematen, epaten. That's to suffer. 
from Paxol. Pasco. Okay? My pastor made a big point about this when he was exegeting the book of Hebrews line by line. And he said, this is a paranomasia. In other words, the writer of Hebrews is told by God to make a joke about this. Do you see any sense that it's a joke or that it's funny in the translation? Oh, no. Why? Because the translator just finished translating verse 7 with piety. So he missed the whole point. Now, the reason why this matters is that in Judaism, okay, then and now, the highest thing you can do, the highest good deed you can do is learn Torah. Okay? And so the Jews had this had this thing. Of course, I was brought up, in, one of my parents converted to Judaism while I was young. So that's how come I know some things about Judaism, Yiddish, and all that. Okay? There was this saying that of the Jews, even when I was a kid, is it, if it's learning, is it suffering? See? If you're learning something, are you really suffering? Yeah, you're going through a lot of effort. But look at the payoff. You learn Torah. See, that's the idea in Judaism then and now. That's why this is a joke. He learned obedience from what he suffered. Yeah, he, he suffered, that's it, Paten, and he got learning for it. Honey, if you work, if you work and work and work and work, and you get a million dollars as a result of your work, I don't care what kind of work it was, you're going to think you were overpaid. And honey, learning Bible, seeing God face to face in the Bible, which is a daily occurrence, okay? There's no amount of money that is as good as this. So who cares what I suffer? Is it suffering if I'm learning Him? If I'm seeing Him face to face? That's in number six. May His face shine upon you. If I'm seeing Him face to face, do I care how much I suffer? Answer, no. So this is a joke totally missed by the translators. Whoever translated the book of Hebrews really needs to go back to school. It's really sad. My pastor didn't miss it. He taught our whole congregation this verse in the Greek, just like he taught all the verses. Okay? It's a joke. If it's, if it's learning, is it suffering? That's what that says in Greek. It's a Yiddishism. No, well, Yiddish didn't exist back then. It's a Hebraism. Now contrast that with Mark. Okay? Let's get rid of the box. Look how he handles this. Again, Mark is going back to his whole miracles thing. They're watching him to see if he'll do miracles. Having introduced them as disputing with him in Mark 2. Now in Mark 3. Oh, they're going to watch him to see if he's going to do a miracle. Yeah, if he can do a miracle, that means he's from God, doesn't it? Oh, but if he's doing it on the Sabbath? God isn't allowed to be God on the Sabbath? On God's own rest day? God isn't allowed to do something that pleases him? Excuse me? Richard Dawkins has a lot in common with these Pharisees. I'm sorry. So Christ said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful to the to the his accusers? Because he knows what they're thinking, because he's God, and that's why he's saying this to them. Because they, they didn't say anything. They this is what they were thinking. And so to prove again that he's God, he's trying to keep on helping them before he has to, you know, slam the judgment on them. He says to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. He commands him as God. <coughs> Excuse me. Then he turns to them, the Pharisees, and says, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save a life or to kill? Obvious answer, yes, it's okay. All right? It's not lawful to do harm on the Sabbath. And in his case, since he's God and can heal him and the man is right there, should he neglect the man? Answer, no. <coughs> Excuse me. They kept silent. They couldn't answer him. 
So after looking at them and corrected translation and their anger, he grieved at the hardness of their heart, said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man was restored. No fanfare, no drum roll, please. No, hi, I'm God. You should respect me. Lots of suffering on his part. Ending the suffering on the man's part. But the Pharisees would rather have the man suffer, okay, or else they want to accuse him, see? Pharisees went out immediately, see? Here we got our key word, immediately. <coughs> so here he does, get this, he does a miracle. What's their response to the miracle? Because immediately is your key word for miracles. It's also a key word for the rapture that's being imminent. That's why Mark's writing. Their reaction to the miracle is what? To go conspire with the Herodians. Now you have to understand in this time, the people that the Pharisees hated the most were the Sadducees and the Herodians. That means the party of Herod who were supporting Herod. The Pharisees hated Herod. Hated him. So all of a sudden, their worst enemies are their new best friends, that's a miracle. See, that's why he's saying immediately. A miracle happens here. The Pharisees suddenly change their mind and conspire with their worst enemies. That was a miracle. Christ's miracle here birthed another miracle here. And the word immediately is what keys you into that. Every time you see the word immediately in the Mark, uh, gospel, gospel of Mark, he's drawing attention to something that's miraculous. Okay, something is immediate, miraculous, next, and he also has a connotation of judgment underneath it. Okay? Immediately, what a miracle! The Pharisees are going against their worst enemies, the Herodians. They're going to side with Herod, who they hate it? Yeah, because it's against Christ. What a miracle is that? How they could destroy Christ. Yeah, it's going to take a miracle to destroy him, actually. The miracle of God standing off at the cross, Isaiah 53, 5 through 10. Actually, through, through 11. Yeah, that's a miracle. The cross is a miracle. And if God didn't allow it, it wouldn't have happened. So, now we got the right-hand side. He learned through what he suffered. Except that in the Greek, this is, you know, you say this with a smile on your face. Is it suffering if it's learning? If it's learning, is it suffering? Say it with a Jewish accent. You know, when I play the Jewish person in drama in, in high school, that's what I did. I used a Jewish accent all the time. This is sort of New York, Bronx, right? I'm not as good at it now. I'm too old. All right. So what else? What's the next miracle that happens? Here's miracle number one in this particular segment. Miracle number two, they side with their worst enemies all of a sudden, immediately, just like that. So what does Jesus do? He withdraws with his disciples. Yeah, face palm time. I need to be alone. You see? Isn't this awesome? Okay, so back to Hebrews. Though he was a son, he if he's learning because he's suffering, He's suffering, so he's learning. Yeah, he's doing the thing that Judaism praises, but the Jews, who were supposedly the best Jews, and mainstream Judaism today is Pharisaical. Yeah, they've been conspiring against Christ ever since, and still are today. Now, I'm not trying to, like, you know, beat up on the Jews. Christians are just as bad. There are Christian Pharisees all over the place. They're in main, mainstream Christianity, mainstream Judaism is that verse right there. That's what they all do. And they do it thinking that they're obeying God. That's the weird part about it. So what do you and I have to do? Withdraw. Face palm, withdraw. When we got to say something nasty, we got to, but not for very long. Because you know what? It hurts. It hurts to be obedient. The biggest hurt in being obedient is to see how everybody else is making fun of God, despising Him. That's what hurts the most. That's the hardest thing to live with in the spiritual life. 
Every day I wish I were dead simply because of this right here. Every day I see more and more of that by Christians and of course by Jews. Both of them in the mainstream. Mainstream Christianity, mainstream Judaism, same thing, Pharisees. And it, it, it's heartbreaking, okay? Grieved. Ish machovot udu a choli. It's Isaiah 53, 4. The heartbreak man, stricken with, stricken with grief. There we go, Isaiah 53, 4, referenced. So of course he withdraws, and that's what we have to do too. Because you can't be around these people too long. Okay? And so, he withdraws, but a whole bunch of people, this is another theme in Mark, they're following him everywhere he goes. Yeah, the Pharisees are following him to try to destroy him. You have this mass movement. If you played it as a play, you'd have thousands of feet moving across the set, following him. Yeah, these guys following him to destroy. And then the multitude following to listen to him talk. But they're not understanding what he says. So do you understand now why the writer of Hebrews says, concerning him we have much to say, but it's hard to talk to you. Because you've become, Greek word here is nothros. It means a dull knife. So it's translated dull of hearing because he introduced, you know, Machaira in Hebrews 4.12. Yeah, who's dull of hearing? The Pharisees are conspiring. They were looking to see if he would heal, which only God to do. Can they be duller than that? Oh, because he's going to do it on the Sabbath? God can't be God on the Sabbath. Like Richard Dawkins saying, God can't be supernatural unless he's the product of an evolutionary process. Well, then God can't be supernatural unless he's subnatural. So then God can't be God if he's not God. Not a God that Dawkins is going to believe in. And they're not going to believe in Christ being God if Christ does a godly thing on the Sabbath. Well, God's not allowed to be God on the Sabbath. Oh, okay. So Christ just doesn't even pay attention to them. Their anger, not his. He's grieved. Ishmaqot wuduhuli. Isaiah 53, 4. Okay. So he heals the guy. And then the second miracle that happens is the Pharisees are suddenly best friends with their worst enemies. All so they can destroy him. So Jesus withdraws. And all the people are following him. Think of patter. All these feet pattering after him. And they came from Jerusalem, from Idumea, the Jordan. This is the other major theme in Mark. Bunch of extras pounding across the stage. Okay? And in order to, like, he's got to get a boat so he can get apart from the crowd. Because look, another miracle again. See, crowd movement, Pharisee attack, miracles he's doing. He's stressing that more than he's stressing the, the information. That Christ said. That's the distinguishing thing in Mark's gospel. And why is he doing that? Because the sign of the temple falling is about to occur. Just as God predicted it would. Right on time. And he's he's that, that's why his his gospel is so full of miracles and crowds moving back and forth on the stage and the Pharisees reacting to the miracles he does with a desire to kill him. See, this is the Pharisee's reaction to the miracle. So he leaves them. But the crowds follow him. And so now, he's got to get on a boat to get away from the crowd. Because why is the crowd following him? Because he healed them. With the result that all those who had afflictions pressed around him in order to touch him. And whenever unclean spirits, see, Mark is going over the top here. This is stuff that's kind of unique to Mark. He told disciples, get a boat ready. For he healed many with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed around him to touch him. And whenever, whenever, see he's getting real, he's, he's being real blanket now. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they said, oh, you're the son of God. And he kept telling them to shut up, and of course they didn't. Whenever he told somebody to shut up, then the person yelled all the more. See, they're not listening to what he says. 
They don't care about what he says. All they want are the signs and the wonders. And their reaction to the signs and the wonders is to cause him more trouble. So he learned through what he suffered. Isn't that cute? All right. So basically, it keeps on going on this theme in Mark. He goes away. He goes up the mountain. Okay. And, but they still came to him. Now, when you're going up a mountain, it was really a big, steep hill. Okay, and that way he could be at the top of it and get better acoustics. Okay, but they're chasing after him. They came to him. He didn't go knock on doors, honey. You don't go out and do so winning. You make your information available and you wait for the people to come to you. That's what a pastor should do, and that's what, if you were an evangelist, you should also do. You park yourself somewhere and you wait for people to come to you. You don't. You're not a white shoe salesman. Jehovah's Witnesses are particularly anti-biblical here. They go knocking on doors and interrupting people in the middle of their private lives. So therefore, they make the gospel look like a fuller brush man. It's disgusting practice. Don't go knocking on any doors doing little so winning. That's what all the King James only people do. But of course, they wouldn't know the Bible if it bit them. Even if, even though they can repeat many gospels the gospel and many other doctrines correctly. They only know how to parrot it. They don't understand scripture. Okay? He went away. They came to him. Hint, hint. Yeah, he learned obedience through what he suffered. See the point? And again, having been made, having been completed, this means mature, the contract of completion. Having been made complete. In other words, the way, the truth, and the life. You know, he had to get the truth in him. He became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Okay? High priest, Kata Melchizedek, versus the Pharisees. See, you aren't going to grow up in Christ unless you grow like Christ did. How did he grow? He grew, he learned through what he suffered. And learning is always a suffering. Not doing works. Okay, and again, perfect means to, to complete a contract. The contract is Isaiah 53.10. <coughs> if you will give your soul as a substitute for sin, you will see long-lived seed. Isaiah 53.10, translated from the Hebrew and English. Okay? So, he's appointing the twelve, and he's giving them special powers too. And this is going on and on and on about this. Okay, but our boy in the book of Hebrews is going to launch into the high priesthood thing after he excoriates his audience who have become dull of hearing like the Pharisees because they don't even understand the elemental doctrines. See, repentance from dead works, changing your mind about dead works. Instead, have the doctrine in you faith toward God, leaving therefore the elementary teaching. See. And that goes on all the way to verse 12. Because if you stay a legalist, like the Pharisees on the left, okay, who are now accusing, see, they're accusing. Oh, he's possessed, that's why he could do the healing. And then Christ tries to reason with them. Can Satan cast out Satan? Okay, see, legalist, left-hand side. Right-hand side, the legalist who the writer of Hebrews is talking to. So he's on a topic that talks directly back to Peter and Jude. But at the same time, in a way, he's tracking to the storyline in Mark. Hopefully that's being demonstrated. It's not the strongest possible evidence that one could make, but I don't know of a stronger case to present right now. I'm just presenting what I see. And if you can improve on it or con contradict it and prove me wrong, I want to see that. Because, you know... I always want to see it if there's evidence proving me wrong. Okay? So that's the end of this segment. Okay, i got to say one more thing about how this is tracking to Mark. We established that we basically got mass crowds going across the stage. They, they follow him wherever he goes. Okay? The scribes and the Pharisees are following him in order to find out some way they can accuse him and make him look bad to the crowds that are following him wherever he goes. In between, there is a natural question you can ask. What about his family? 
wasn't his family with him? And you don't find out until Luke, John 6 more about this problem. His own people heard of it. They went out to take custody of him. They were saying he lost his senses. Now, I think this is another unique verse in Mark. So let's find out. This is his family, his own people. That they're, they're translating it in idiomatic English. Okay, there. Okay, so now let's find out. See, kaituntas hoi parautu. Para means those belonging to, those of his clan. Okay? This is Exerkomai. They went out. They're leaving. They're hearing of the crowd, following him. They hear about this, and look what they're saying. He's gone mad. They're accusing Christ. See, it's not merely the Pharisees. See? You got those following him, and he comes home. He comes home to his house, to his town. The crowd gathered so much that they couldn't even eat. This would be like mobbing a, a superstar, okay? So when his clan heard of it, and it's his own family too, as we're gonna see a little bit later on in this passage. Upon hearing it, his own clan, his own group, his own family, they went out they left in order to take him, Christ, under custody. They're blaming him for the crowd. So they were against him too. You see, on the right hand side, concerning him in blue, concerning him we have much to say but it's hard to explain since you've become so dull of hearing. Now look, he grew up with these people. How could they not know he was Messiah? And they're going to try and take custody of him. This is a legal term, okay? This is kratao. It's used for ruling, okay? When, you, when a policeman seizes you, takes you under arrest, takes you in custody. That's what this word is, is saying. They're going to take him, Christ, not the crowds, but Christ in the custody, as if it were his fault. Right hand side, concerning him we have much to say, but it's kind of hard to explain because you're so dull minded. You can't even hear. How is it that his own family can't tell? And what are they saying? Oh, he's lost his senses. He's gone crazy. He's out of his wits. I love you. I love you, said the little old blue man. Huh? He's nuts. So who's more dull of hearing? The scribes that are listed in the next verse, you know, for the Pharisees, or his own family? See on the right hand side, dull of hearing. They were around him. See, familiarity breeds contempt. They were around him all the time when he was growing up from a baby. How many miracles did they see? And you know, he, was, he had to be the most gorgeous person alive. Because he doesn't have any sin in him. If you don't have any sin in you, you're, you're healthier and you live longer and the whole bit. That's not always true. But it's certainly true if you have no sin in you. Because his body's going to be perfect. There's no sin in it. Okay? He can't even die. Except God wills it. Alright? His family. So. His own people. Try to take custody of him. Okay? The scribes there were accusing him. And so now he called them. To himself. The people. And of course that included the scribes and the family. How can Satan cast out Satan? Okay, kingdom divided against itself, cannot stand. These are elementary things. See the right hand side? He has to talk to them about elementary God 101 stuff. He has to actually think for them. 
If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, then he can't stand. He's, he's finished. He's defeated. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property. See, if you're a strong believer, if you believe in Christ, nobody can plunder you without first binding you. In other words, be careful who you listen to. Remember, that's going to be coming up in Mark 4. Be careful who you listen to. That's coming up in Mark 4, 24. He's leading up to it here. You're bound by what you hear. See? He learned obedience from what he suffered. Okay? Hold on, i got to turn off my alarm. Sorry about that. I was supposed to go to sleep tonight and didn't. Okay? He learned obedience through what he suffered. Yeah. And you're in obedience to whoever binds you. So, Satan is not the one doing the binding. He can't rise up against himself. Duh. All right? So, truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven. But whoever, whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes the Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. And man, I'm telling you, so many people have asked, well, what is that? Go look at John 16, 9. John elaborates on what this is. Okay? Because they never believe in me, is the proper translation of that verse. When it says, because they do not, in the Greek it means... They didn't in the past, and they still aren't at the present when he speaks. So it means never. Because they never believed in me. If you didn't in the past, and you're not doing it now, in the Greek they have this kind of interesting, kind of like perfective present or culminative way of saying it that's like, they haven't until then, and they still aren't now. But that's kind of inelegant in English, so just use the word never. Because they never believed in me. That's the eternal sin. If you don't believe, you go to hell. That's the only sin for which you can go to hell. And you're blaspheming against the Spirit because he's the one witnessing that Christ is the Messiah. Now why is that? Why does he bring that up? Because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. They're saying that the Holy Spirit's witness to them is not the Holy Spirit. So they're blaspheming his testimony. You see how how that how neat that is? How well that works? They're blaspheming the character of the Holy Spirit and calling him unclean. Now look, I'm tying back up down to here. This is so embarrassing. And when it happens to you in your own life, you'll know how true it is. His own people heard of this. Instead of blaming the crowd, they want to take custody of Christ. Because they're blaming him. Oh, he's out of his mind to talk like this. Why is he out of his mind? Didn't they know for 30 years when he was grown up who he was? Their own cousin John witnessed that yes, he's the Christ? I mean, come on. Now look. This is one of one of the really, it's, it's not, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if Mary instigated this or the brothers instigated this. You find out more in John 8 through, 6 through 8, John elaborates on this. His mother and his brothers arrived. They stood outside. They didn't want to hear what he was teaching. They stood outside because they're sending word to him and he's supposed to come to him, them. They're asserting family over father. He learned obedience from what he suffered. He's got to suffer the disbelief of his own family. They're standing outside. They don't want to hear what he has to say. He's supposed to be subservient to them. They send word to him. It's really sent. The word word isn't in there. They sent to him. It's, a, it's an expression for, you know, sending him an order. Called him, meaning called him to, to stop what he's doing, teaching the word of God, and go instead to them. Family is more important than the word of God. Do you know how many Christians go for this? The hypocrisy in Christianity is unbelievable. 
family's more important than the Word of God. Well, why are you studying that Bible? You should be helping your family instead. My family doesn't need my help. I'm sorry. And if my family doesn't respect that the Word of God is my first father, then honey, I don't want to associate with my family. Yeah, and his family's trying to play the same game on him. And someday in your lifetime, if you actually get serious about scripture, this is going to happen to you. Your family will play the family card against you. Oh, well, all you care about is that Bible. I had somebody tell me, well, in the time that you studied Bible, you could have gotten a degree in chemistry or physics. Uh, I think the Word of God is a little more important than physics or chemistry, sorry. I'd rather do this than anything else in life. And you don't like that? Honey, I don't care. Yeah, learning through what you suffer. And you have to suffer your family playing the family card. Saying it's more important to be with them than learn the Word of God? I don't think so. So if I sound a little militant to you, about the people who are hypocritical and they place God second and pretend he's first because they're placing family first and fitting with people first. Now you know why. They did it to Christ. His own family did it to him. They played the family card. Oh, you should come see us. You shouldn't be talking Bible to the crowd. Who is his father? So what does he say? The crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, Behold, your mother and brothers are looking for you. Looking? How are they looking for you? They're standing outside. They know Dalgon well where he is. They're not looking for you. They're trying to order you to stop what you're doing and go to them instead. So what does he say? And very properly, honey, who are my mother and my brothers? And he looks about at the crowd who are sitting around him listening to him teach. Behold, my mother and my brothers. This wording is a little different from the other Gospels. So maybe he said it more than once. Whoever does the will of God is my mother, my brother, my sister. See, he's got his priorities straight. They don't. So I'm sorry if your family's going to try to play the family card and say, oh, you, don't, you shouldn't be studying scripture because you should be with us. And unless God says, yes, you do have an obligation, because there are family obligations. But usually this stuff comes up when it's way beyond your family obligations. Or when you have no family obligations. Because what it is, is they're jealous that you care about God more than them. I've had that said to me many times. Too bad. Why are you going to be jealous of God? I can't love you if I don't love him. That's the theme of First John 2. See, he learned through what he suffered. Look at what he's suffering. Okay? And what are they? Dull of hearing. Right here, baby. Impossible to renew them as long as they want to crucify him and put him to open shame. What do you think is happening right here? What are they doing? Now, later in life, they came around. But not at this point. Well, we're playing the family card. And so he rightly says, uh, excuse me, who are my real relatives? Those who are doing the will of God. And what's the will of God? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. There's no people in there. And how are you going to love God? You learn his word. He learned through what he suffered. He became the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I'm sorry this turned into a bit of a rant. But hopefully you see that, yeah, I guess the writer of Hebrews really is tracking. This is very similar to the style in John uh, 8, where it's tracking to Psalm 16. At first I thought it was just verses, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 10, but he's tracking it for the whole chapter. And I already did videos on that in the Great I Am section. It's in my LXX playlist. Okay, so have a gander at that if you want to see a similar style to what seems to be happening here in the book of Hebrews. He's tracking according to an outline, a thematic outline. And yeah, he's still playing on Hebrews. I mean, Hebrews is still playing on Peter. 
So this is about the priesthood, okay? But he's taking a little digression here about their dull hearing. And that just happens to meet with all the crowd pleasing in the family card and the Pharisees out to accuse him and the people coming after him because all they want is a miracle. Yeah, they're all dull of hearing, really. So this is pretty neat. I'm using that in the King James only version. King James version of the term meat. Pretty apt. Meanwhile, he's learning how to be a high priest, kind of Melchizedek. That means king priest. That'll be developed in Hebrews 5. I mean, later in Hebrews. Through chapter 10. So I'm going to stop here right now, but just notice, okay, your family, your real family in life are the people who care about God. And if your own physical family doesn't, then you're going to have to make a choice. Is it the first commandment or are you just going to fit in with the people? And yeah, you got family obligations. That's 1 Timothy 5.8, I think. He who doesn't care for his family is worse than an unbeliever. But beyond those obligations, what do you owe them? Who is your first obligation? Who is your first family? The people of God. The people learning the word of God. Right here. Peace out.